There's always new trends happening in card making. Today, I'm sharing my take on a few of the latest ones, including one I'm trying for the very first time. Have you noticed? Stencils have really ramped up lately. You can flip them, turn them, layer them, even spin them. This is a four layer set from Simon Says Stamp called Poppy Field, and just wait until you see how beautiful the result is. I'm using a six inch square piece of cardstock so I can put it right in the corner of my stencil mat and then jam each layer of the stencil in there as well to make it easy to line up everything properly. I'm using terracotta ink, which is a really rich brown red for my poppies. I'm going heavy at the base of each shape and letting it fade out by lightening the pressure. I continued through the three layers of petals and I really love seeing these flowers come together. The final stencil layer has the leaves and flower centers. I'm using hot tub for the leaves and again I'm allowing some variation of pressure to give me different intensities of color and look like dimension. This one poppy's stem and leaf go over another poppy, so I decided to do some quick masking with the edge of some post-it tape and to make it look like the shorter poppies in front of the taller one. Then I used some s'mores ink for the flower centers. Just look how gorgeous this is. My six inch panel allows me to cut it down to get enough for two cards, and I added some sauna blending around the edges to warm them up and add a little sunshine to my scenes. Layering stencils can be geometric too, and this dainty plaid from Pinkfresh Studios is one of my favorites. There are three stencils with diagonal lines, and once you've blended them one way, you flip them over to get the lines going in the opposite direction. If you use all three stencils both ways, you'll get full coverage of your panel, but I like to leave a bit of white space, so I just filled it in until I had created a fresh and airy plaid. My next specialty stencil is a spinning stencil. This is the Stencils 360 tool, which works with specially designed round stencils to create amazing circular patterns. This one's a mandala, but there's lots of others. I have a whole playlist on my channel if you want to learn more about this tool. To keep it brief, you basically use the markings on the outside of the tool and the guide ring to turn the stencil to the correct angle. In this case, my design has eight complete turns, and you can see as I'm working that it's building up a really pretty mandala design. I'm using two colors on each of the three holes to add even more interest to my design. Isn't this amazing? Seems like everyone has these glittery watercolors these days. And why not? They really pack a ton of sparkle into these little pans. I took mine out of the little tin they came in and I put them in with my other metallic watercolors from Altenew. To add splatter, I use an aqua brush to add quite a lot of water to the pan and then saturate the brush with the paint and tap it with my fingers over the panels. Gel plates have been around in the mixed media area for a long time, but they've recently become more popular with card makers. I've really been enjoying using these little shimmer paints from Dilutions with mine, and I chose three that kind of match the Catherine Pooler inks I've been using so far. This is a very simple and basic way to use a gel plate, just putting a couple of dabs of paint on the plate, then brayering it out until it's nice and thin, and putting a piece of paper on top to pull the print. I like to use Nina Index paper, it's thicker than printer paper, but not quite as thick as cardstock, and it seems to pick up the paint well, and it's a good layering weight for using on cards. Every time I watch Simon Hurley use his stamping foam, I'm inspired, but I never seem to get around to it. So it seemed like today was a good day to give it a try. I started by heating it up for about 20 seconds with my heat tool, and then I pressed it into a Catherine Pooler background stamp, putting lots of pressure on to try and get a really good impression. To be fully honest, this was my third try to get the heat and pressure right. I know that Simon uses an acrylic block on his, and I've got another idea I'll share in a minute. But third time's a charm, as they say, and I feel like I have a better handle on how to do this next time. I added ink to the foam, and because Catherine's inks are foam ink pads, they can kind of catch on the edge and leave a little bit of extra ink. I don't think that would happen if you had a felt or a fabric ink pad. I used some blending brushes to soften the lines between the colors and then spritzed it before pressing it down onto my panel of cardstock. I did use a block to help to get even pressure and even with that little extra bit of ink up there in the corner, I was happy with my results, especially for my first time actually stamping it down. I inked it up again to see if I could avoid picking up that excess ink on the corners and I can see that I could easily get better at this. Then I used water and a cloth to wipe it clean and it all comes off with no staining. I heated it up again to get rid of the pattern and to warm it up for another stamp. 
This time I left the stamping foam on my glass work surface so that it had something very firm behind it, and I pressed the stamp down onto it. I feel like the results were slightly better this way, but both ways worked. I inked it up again, spritzed it, and stamped it down. This time I think I had a little too much water, but I really do feel like it would be easy to get good at this, and it's such a great way to stretch what you already have. Cover plate dies, stencils, background stamps, even hot foil plates. In fact, I think this is probably worth a video of its own, so we'll come back to this tool sometime soon. Right now, hot foiling is everywhere and it's beautiful, but when you add up the cost of the machine and the plates, it can get expensive. And I wonder if the recipients of our cards can even tell the difference. Is it worth the investment? Only you can decide. When I want a shiny look, I just heat emboss. I started by creating some s'mores colored cardstock by just smooshing the ink pad onto white cardstock. This way I know it'll match the browns I've used in my designs. I pulled out the Essential Sentiment set from Waffle Flower, and look at that, I've still got a bunch of the dies taped together from a previous sentiment making session. I laid them down onto my brown cardstock and cut them out with my die cutter. Now I do have that brown background, but if I leave the die cuts in that, it's going to be hard to see where to line up the stamps. I also have a white template in the pocket from my previous session, so a higher contrast will make this a whole lot easier. Before I put the white template into my Misty though, I put some mint tape onto the back with the sticky side showing through. And when I lay the brown die cuts in, they'll stick to that tape and I'll be able to heat emboss all the sentiments at once because it's more like one panel. Once I had the stamps lined up, I picked them up with the Misty door and I prepped my die cuts with an anti-static powder tool from Tailored Expressions. Then I stamped them down several times with some embossing ink. My ink pad is getting a little dry, so I think I ended up doing it three times. Then I poured some gold glitter embossing powder over top and tapped off the excess before heating it all up in my foil lined shoebox lid. Using this lid keeps my fingers from getting burned since I don't have to hold on to the panel, and I think that the foil reduces warping by reflecting the heat back to the other side of the panel. Aren't they pretty? It's definitely a different look than hot foiling, but as I say, you can decide whether that's something you want or not. I really can't explain this, but I cannot get my head around a full three and a half by eight and a half inch slimline card. The proportions seem strange to me, and to be honest, it's hard to get a nice photo of it for Instagram or YouTube. Also, I would have to go and find envelopes to fit. So instead, if I'm feeling the need, I do a mini slim card. This one is three and a half by six and a quarter inches. It's still not my favorite, but I did find envelopes in my house, so that makes it much more appealing. For this card, I used half of my mandala design and part of the plaid panel I created. So if slimline or mini slimline is something you want to explore, I would encourage you to see how you can use the things you've already got before buying any specialty products, especially the dies, which can be quite expensive. Here's the other half of my mandala working equally as well on a regular A2 size card, along with that gel printed background. I finished all the cards with some golden illusion gems from Crafty Meraki. And here's the stamping foam card. I added a brown frame and a white circle behind my sentiment to help it stand out from the busy pattern. And as I say, I'll be back with more stamping foam ideas in the future. Finally, the two poppy cards. They're so pretty. I made a four and a quarter inch square card with the smaller piece, offsetting it on a brown panel that I had actually cut from the center of the brown frame I created for this one the full A2 size version. No one will ever know that there's a big hole behind that beautiful sunny scene of poppies. I love to try new techniques and tools. In fact, I think it's important to try new things and learn from them so we grow creatively. But you can also grow by finding ways to get the look without the new tools. And it's also okay just to decide that something isn't for you. After all, when you're sending a card to someone, it really is the thought that counts. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.